Hi folks, my name is Asher Whitney and I use he, they pronouns. I'm excited to be here today to share with you our winter tomato variety trial. So some of the goals for the project were to evaluate winter storage tomatoes for productivity, quality, and storability. And so here you can see this is our table that shows all the different varieties that we grew out as well as their seed sources and a little bit of description about where they came from and what they look like. And up above, you can see I have an annotated image of a spread of a few of these varieties that we shared at a dry farming event this summer. Many of these varieties are traditionally grown in Italy and Spain and throughout the winter are used for foods such as pizzas and pan con tomat. Um, they are also traditionally stored in, stored in ristras, as you can see up in the right corner. Some of the unique things about these tomato varieties that help improve their storability is thicker skin, lower water content, and firmer flesh at the time of harvest. And many of these tomatoes we feel could provide a niche market for growers beyond the summer months. So first we had to establish our plants. And so we had 17 different varieties, three of which had multiple seed sources and three varieties which were also distributed to growers in the Pacific Northwest with a protocol. These plants were started in plugs and up potted once in a greenhouse. They were then planted in the field on May 18th, this last year in 2021, with one quart of water at the time of planting. They were spaced with 16 square feet each with four by four spacing. And then throughout the season, we had to manage the weeds and we did this via wheel hoe and hula hoe. And then once fruit ripened, plants were harvested once a week from the beginning of August to just about the end of September. And then yield data was taken by counting and weighing the marketable fruit and unmarketable fruit. The types of blemishes leading to unmarketable fruit were noted. And then growers were given a pro protocol that detailed their planting, management, harvest, and storage practices to keep it consistent between different growing sites. And then throughout the harvest season, we also had to eliminate a few varieties. And we did this based off of whether they had high disease incidence such as significant necrosis of the leaves of the plant or severe fruit blemishing. Another reason we eliminated varieties was if they had over 50% blossom end rot for three or more weeks. In all the images, you can see some of the different blemishes that we saw on the fruits, such as sunburn, blossom end rot, discoloration, and the plant you can see has some cl coloring, also known as chlorosis, and some death on the leaves. And these are the varieties that we eliminated throughout the season. You can see the reasons they were eliminated and the date they were cut from the trial. And then after our harvest season was over, each variety was each variety that made it through the elimination process was selected to be sorted in either a ristra or a box. And then out of the varieties that had multiple seed sources, a single source was selected for all varieties except for the Pignolo del Vesuvio which had two of the four seed sources selected for storage. And in the chart below, you can see the conditions that we stored our fruit in compared to the ideal conditions that a manufacturer or farmer might want to keep theirs at. Then during storage, we took bricks and pH data and a subset of each harvest was selected to do this starting two months after harvest, the data started being collected while the harvests were from various different time periods during the season. A sample of three tomatoes from each harvest was selected for each variety. These were emulsified and then strained and used to take bricks and pH measurements. It should be noted that during our bricks and pH data collection, there was a blind spot during the first two months after harvest where we were not able to take this type of data. We were only able to gather the yield data during that time. And next we have our slides showing our yield and quality. So some of the top performing varieties you can see have very little unmarketable percent of their fruit that was unmarketable in figure one. And then in figure two, it shows the pounds of marketable fruit per plant by the variety. So Anna Rita also had some of the lowest unmarketable and some of the highest yield per plant. And then on the right, we also have a chart showing you the code name that was on the map for our varieties and what their actual name is. And here we show you the average fruit size by variety. This average fruit size is in pounds and it was calculated off of the count of the fruit 
versus the weight during yield data collection. And then you can also see the unmarkable pounds per plant by variety. And Anarita also, as well as PG1 or Pinolo Giallo 1 and Pinolo del Vesuvio 1 had some of the lowest rates as well as Petit del Romulet and Pinolo Vesuvio 5. So for our storage in bricks here, you can see that the bricks changed a little bit throughout storage based on variety, but was not significant. And the pH seemed to be pretty consistent across all varieties. The percent of fruit loss during storage can be shown in figure six, where you can see the varieties that lost the most fruit during storage tended to be the fruit stored in boxes, as well as the varieties Bombetta, Malarkey, Malacara, and St. Hyum de Say Solivaris. And here we have our final summary slide de detailing which varieties did best. So here you can see that Anarita and Petit del Romulet did the bet had the highest yield overall across all varieties and across the small fruit varieties. They also had the lowest unmarkable yield and highest conservation during storage. St. Hyum, they say Solivaris, out of the medium fruit had the highest yield and the lowest unmarkable yield in the medium fruit category. However, throughout storage, it had a high loss upwards of 50%. Malacara, which is also of the medium fruit size, just like St. Hyum, was one of the growers ones that they stated they would grow again the most. 85% of the growers stated they would want to grow this again. However, the variety Pinola del Vesuvio shared with the growers had a higher overall rating than Malacara. And then finally, Pinola Giallo was one of my favorites as well as the rest of my team's favorites for its color and flavor. It was one of the ones I was able to sample over the summer and had a nice sweet flavor after about a month of storage. Finally, I would like to thank everybody who helped make this project possible throughout the year, including the Dry Farming Collaborative, the Culinary Breeding Network, and Seedlink, who helped us collect data with our grower participants. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm excited to hear your questions.